Hello, um, it's four o'clock, so I guess we'll get started. Um, this is pair programming from 2,000 kilometers away, strategies for distributed agile teams. Um, if you were here in the last talk, welcome back. Um, if not, my name is Jen Spinney. I'm a software engineer at Hewlett Packard Enterprise. I work on the Diego team. I'm a full-time contributor. Um, I work from Seattle, Washington. Um, right now, there's no one else on the Diego team in Seattle, Washington, so that means this is my life. I do remote development every day, um, eight hours a day. Um, um, I want to talk a little bit about what I'm going to talk about here. Um, Diego is an agile, distributed team. Um, and in some ways, those words, agile and distributed, um, are kind of clashing. Um, and a lot of people say that agile can only be done in a co-located way. Um, but I think the Diego team has worked out a couple of strategies that I think are working pretty well for us in terms of doing distributed uh, agile engineering, and so that's what I'm here to talk to you about. We're going to talk about the tools we use, um, the procedures that we use, and our team culture, um, what we do to make it work. Uh, so who is Diego? Uh, we're made up of nine engineers and one product manager. We're made up of three different companies. Right now, that's Pivotal, IBM, and HPE but it's been other companies as well in the past. We're a constantly rotating team in general. In the Cloud Foundry core, people are switching between teams every couple months. Um, we have engineers in three time zones. Uh, the max time zone difference is three hours. Uh, that's the US East Coast and the US West Coast has a three hour time zone difference. Uh, we have five cities that we work from, uh, San Francisco, Seattle, New York, Raleigh, Regina. And uh, we've become increasingly remote, more and more remote over time. Um, and so I think over time, we've also been building up this muscle about how to do agile development. Um, and I think we're in a pretty good spot right now. Um, so what is agile? Um, there are tons of books about this, tons of internet flame wars about this. I don't want to give you the definition of agile because I'm sure I'm going to be wrong in some way, or someone's going to think I'm wrong, and I don't know if I'm going to be able to give you uh, a definition that everyone's going to agree with. So I'd rather not like go into what is Agile, what is Big A Agile, what is Little A Agile. I'd just rather talk about how we do Agile on the Diego team um, and in Cloud Foundry in general, like what that looks like for us. And I can tell you exactly how we do development and what principles we use. Um, so uh, we do a type of Agile that's called extreme programming. But I think even that, we're maybe not doing exactly ad extreme programming, but our own brand of it. Um, so I'll tell you exactly what our principles are what agile development means to us, and then I'm going to go through and go through this list. Um, I'm going to first explain um, what um, each of these principles are and how this works um, in a uh, normal co-located environment um, and explain each of these principles. And then I'm going to revisit and I'm going to go through and talk about what all these mean um, in a remote atmosphere and what we need to change. Um, so the most important um, aspect of our team culture is um, pair programming. Um, all code on Cloud Foundry is pair programmed. Uh, that means we have one computer, uh, two mice, two keyboards, two mirrored monitors. So we have two engineers working eight hours in a day, sitting next to each other, working together on the same machine, on the same problem. Uh, typically, we have um, roles called a driver and a navigator. So the driver is the person actually doing the typing in that moment and clicking and stuff like that. Um, the navigator is the person that tells them in kind of broad strokes what to do next, um, the larger vision, um, and kind of guides the next steps. Um, and these roles are changing frequently. Like it can be just like within a minute, you, you know, you can switch back and forth, or it can be, you know, for a, an hour, there's one person that's a driver and navigator. It's just kind of how you feel with that person in that moment. Um, so we work a 40 hour week, that means eight hours of pairing every day. Um, and in the ideal world, in a single time zone team, that means that we have everyone come in at the exact same time. So at 9 a.m. we start, and at 6 p.m. we leave. And we all go to lunch at the same time. We go to lunch at 12.30. Um, this is not to be like strict for the sake of being strict. This is so that we can maximize the amount of time that we're actually spend, spending doing pairing as opposed to working on code so, in a solo way. Um, so this is an example pair programming station. Here we have um, two monitors, two mice, two keyboards. Um, in this case, we actually have a third monitor in the middle. 
Um, this is just one example setup. They all kind of look basically like this. We have two uh, monitors side by side. The developers are either going to be standing or sitting right next to each other. Um, and you can customize it a little bit on the team. Like individual teams or individual people might have slight preferences. Like in this example, we have a third monitor to have Slack in the middle, but that's, you know, these details don't really matter so much. Um, on the Diego team, people love their individual keyboards and mice. So the first thing that happens usually at the beginning of the day is everyone takes their own mouse and runs, you know, to wherever station they're going to be and plugs in their mouse and their keyboard because everyone needs to have their own special one. Uh, so the first thing we do uh, every morning is stand up. Um, the people go around the room. One person from each pair will say very briefly what they did the previous day. Um, and we decide what the pairs are going to be for that day. So generally, we switch pairs every single day. Um, sometimes you might stick with a person for two days in a row. But anything longer than that, at least on the Diego team, is, um, is just not done um, because we have a large enough team. For a smaller team, maybe you'd have to do that more often. Um, so then the pairs are assigned for that day. Um, this is usually up to the anchor. Um, the, the anchor is the person that's been on the team usually the longest, um, and so they just kind of orchestrate this meeting. Um, and we have a couple of roles that we assign to certain pairs. So we have someone that's, uh, we have a pair that's the interrupt. That's the pair that other people from outside the team can tap on the shoulder and um, interrupt with random questions throughout the day. We have someone that's responsible for monitoring the build and another pair that's responsible for monitoring GitHub activity and stuff like that. Um, and so just as a reminder, I'm going through right now um, what it looks like in a co-located world. This is sort of the ideal situation of how we do development. And then after this, I'm going to come back and we're going to talk about what it's like when you add the remote element to it and what parts need to change. Um, so at the end of stand-up, this is our result. Uh, we have a whiteboard that has uh, all of the pairs listed out and the tracks they're going to be working on that day. Um, it'll have the roles that each pair is going to do. So this way, we have this whiteboard on display in the Diego um, work area. Someone from another team can come by in person and look at this board and say, oh, I have something, a question related to the SSH track or something like that. I guess I'll have to go talk to these guys that are working on SSH. Or I have just a general interrupt, so I'm going to go bother the interrupt pair and stuff like that. Um, and so usually this is generally on display for everyone, both people in the team and outside the team in the Diego pairing area. Um, another huge aspect of our culture is test-driven development, or TDD for short. Um, you may have heard the term red-green refactor, the idea being that first thing you do when you set out to do a work item, we also call that a story, is you write a failing test or a red test. So this makes sure that the test you're writing is actually testing what you mean to test. So you're testing what the story actually requires, and you're not letting your own implementation guide what you end up uh, implementing in the end. Um, you don't like drift. Um, so you, at the very beginning when you start you say this is what's required and so you write a test and you have it clear in your mind this is what's actually required in order to deliver the story. It also makes sure that uh, you don't write your test afterwards and you accidentally write a bad test that would have passed trivially. Um, and in general we want to only be writing code that makes tests pass. If we have code in there that didn't make some test move from failing to passing, then we don't really know that that, test, that code is actually tested and if someone were to go and refactor that, um, no tests would break and we're in a kind of a un more unmaintainable situation. Uh, so on refactoring, in general we only want to refactor when all the tests are green, that is when all the tests are passing. Um, so we don't want to have a broken test and then start doing some random little method changes here and there because then we don't know that what we actually changed um, was uh, uh, broke anything or not because some of the tests were failing anyway. Um, and so the, in strict TDD, we say only write code if it makes a test pass. Um, and so the result of this is that you have, sorry, and the result of this is that you have um, a lot of um, a concise code because the code should only be there in order to make a test pass. And it also means that you have a ton of tests because it means that for every bit of code you want to write, you need to have a test that corresponds to it. So you end up with a ton of tests um, and pretty concise and maintainable code. Um, another key principle of our team is shared code ownership. So there's no one person or one pair that's responsible for a section of code. The entire team owns the entire code base. 
Um, and this is helped a lot by our frequent pair rotation. The idea is we don't want to have information silos where one person just you know knows one area really well, and then that person gets sick, and you know then we're like, what do we do? That per all that knowledge is in that person's head. So that's why we try to always be rotating pairs so everyone has eyes on it and everyone has contributed to it. Um, you know, because the idea is like more people's input can catch more bugs um, and prevent um, sort of one particular person's um, specific style from showing through too much and everything is a little bit more standard. Um, so we also share responsibility and blame, that means. So, you know, we don't point at a specific developer and say, like, you know, oh, his code broke everything or something like that, because everything's our code. Like, every line of code is probably written by four engineers over the course of, like, you know, if a particular story takes two days to write, you know, maybe that's three engineers or four engineers that have worked on it. Uh, another key principle for us is continuous integration and release. Continuous integration, or CI for short, this is the idea that we're constantly integrating our code, our develop branch, into our master branch. So we always check in directly to our develop branch um, through Git, and then it goes through a huge series of tests um, to make sure the code is stable and doesn't break any existing functionality. Um, and then when it's ready, uh, when it's past all those things, it gets merged into master. Um, our master branch is meant to always be solid, validated code. The idea is you can always release from master at any point in time. Um, and so this means that we can release frequently whenever we need to for any reason. Um, and the, the master branch is always kept clean and we don't push directly to master. Uh, this is our pipeline. It's pretty overwhelming right now. Um, but basically when you push to develop on the Diego team, your code is going to enter um, from the left-hand side and then go through all of these boxes. Each box is either a test or a deployment step or something like that. Um, and once it passes all these things, um, you can see there's some red right now, which is not, you know, that's not great. Um, but once it passes all these things, it comes out on the right-hand side and it's been merged to develop and it's ready to be um, made into a final release that can be published. Um, another key aspect of our development culture is regular retrospectives. So every week we get together as a group, we talk about what went well, what didn't go well in the past week. Um, this is absolutely um, key to our entire process because the team di dynamic is constantly changing because we're always bringing in new people um, and we need to always be adapting to our current engineers and learning and making ourselves the best team we can possibly be. We gotta have, make sure that if we made a mistake this week, that's fine, we just gotta make sure we don't make that mistake again next week. Um, so, um, in general, the way the retrospective works is we have a whiteboard um, with three columns. We have the good, disgust, and bad column. The first 10 minutes of the retro, everyone has a marker. People go up to the board. They write things in all three columns, whatever comes to mind. And then the next 50 minutes are spent actually going through all those t topics and discussing them and cr creating action items out of that that are going to be done in the next week. Um, uh, the last thing that we do. Um, is collaborative story estimation. So we have a weekly meeting where we look at everything in the backlog that we haven't talked about yet. Um, so we have this backlog and tracker, and our PM creates new stories, and he writes um, acceptance criteria down. Um, and then we as a team, the engineers come together, we talk about um, the acceptance criteria there. It's our, it's our opportunity as engineers to give feedback to the PM and say, we don't really agree with this acceptance criteria. Um, or we can talk about the, implement, the broad implementation details and how we're going to do this. So we kind of get all on the same page as a team before one pair goes off and goes to implement it. Um, then we, uh, we point the story, we estimate the story with the Fibonacci numbers. Um, the point of story pointing is twofold. One is so that we have some velocity estimates. So we can say, well, we know in general we can do about like 15 units of work in a week or whatever it is. And then when we see how much work we have left until a certain um, feature is done, then we can say, well, I guess it'll take a month to do that feature because it has that many, sorry, complexity points. Um, the other advantage of doing this uh, collaborative story estimation uh, is just a chance for us all to um, sit down as an entire engineering team and talk about something at a broad level and make sure whoever the pair is that picks it up is kind of doing what the entire group had in mind um, for implementation. Um, so that was just the principles that we use in a normal co-located environment. That's just the way that we work on the Diego team and in Cloud Foundry in general. Um, so now I want to go through and talk about um, what changes with remote development 
Um, what parts of these stay the same? What parts need to change? Um, some parts are totally unchanged, like the TDD, test-driven development. That doesn't matter if you're remote or local. Shared code ownership, same thing. It's just a philosophy. And continuous integration doesn't matter. Um, but there are some other things that need to be modified. Um, the most obvious one is pair programming. So we're not actually physically sitting next to each other anymore. Um, we have a couple different tools that we use for this. Um, for Windows and Mac, there's a tool called Screen Hero. Um, this shares your entire screen. It gives you two cursors, and it gives both people control over um, clicking on things and typing things. Um, in general, it works pretty well for us. Um, the downside is that it doesn't have a Linux client, so, um, and some of the people on our team have Linux machines. So for Linux, we use a different combination of tools, depending on what we're doing that day. If we really do need to share the full screen, then we might use um, like Google Hangouts screen share or appear in screen share. Um, or, and we have, in addition to that, we have like a voice element as well, because Screen Hero also provides voice on top of uh, screen sharing. So usually we have to do like a two-pronged approach where we have one tool for screen sharing and one tool for voice. Um, and we also use Chrome Remote Desktop. Um, the other thing that we more commonly do if we don't really need to share the screen for that day is to use uh, Tmux. Um, that'll just share the terminal. Um, and that works pretty easy, and that's also pretty good if we have one person that has a bad connection for the day or something like that. Uh, Tmux is a lot faster than sharing the entire screen. Um, Stand-ups. So we don't have that physical board anymore, that whiteboard where we have the actual Polaroids of the team members' faces and stuff like that. But instead, we have a Google spreadsheet where we've uploaded the Polaroids of everyone's face. Um, and in a way, the spreadsheet's actually a little bit nicer. I think this is one thing that's um, probably even better than it used to be, um, because we can do analytics on this afterwards, and we can see, oh, man, that person's pairing way too much with that person, or that person and that person never pair together. And we can kind of, like, after the fact, look at trends and make sure that we're actually pairing people together um, with a cor you know, correct distribution. Um, and this is also, you know, fully, it's totally public, anyone can, uh, sorry, anyone can view it, um, and we can put our pairing roles here as well. Um, in general, I think this has actually been an upgrade from the co-located solution that we had before. Um, for the retros, um, we don't have a whiteboard anymore, so no one has markers and is going up anymore. Um, we just use a Google Docs spreadsheet, it's pretty simple. Um, the only slight disadvantage, I guess, is the people in, you know, who are actually in the conference room, because we still have a couple that are in San Francisco in a conference room. They have to, like, pass around a keyboard to each other so everyone can type in the spreadsheet, but that's not really so bad. Um, so the retros have been pretty unaffected. We just all get onto a voice call or a, a video call, usually. Um, that's pretty easy. Uh, story pointing, that's similar. We're all in a big video call together. Um, one change that we made was to start um, making sure that all items to be discussed that day are tagged with the IPM label. This means we can just click on that label and it brings up everything that we're going to talk about during that IPM. Um, when we were first doing this, we would you know, say things more like, well, we're talking about this story, kind of scroll halfway down, and when you see that, then you know, it's the one that starts with this. Um, but, so that was a small thing that we did that made it a lot easier. Um, make sure that we, we make sure the cameras are on because we um, point using our fingers. We hold up a number of finger uh, to say how many points we want to allocate to that story. Otherwise, it's not really that different than in person. Um, one uh, challenge in general, um, this applies to pairing, but it applies to really everything about how the team runs, is dealing with the time zone differences. So like I mentioned, we have people on the east coast of the US and the west coast of the US, so it's a three-hour time zone difference. Um, when we first started having a large east coast presence, um, we just kind of kept doing things the way we were doing it before, where we'd say, well, our stand-up is at 9 a.m. west coast time. Um, but that meant that you know the east coasters had three hours where they were online, and it was part of their work day, but they didn't know who they were working on. They would maybe grab what they were working on the previous day, but it wasn't really clear what they were supposed to do. Um, so we started doing these uh, time zone specific sync ups. So we have a 9 a.m. East Coast sync up for the East Coasters, and then a 3 p.m. West Coast 
um, sync up for the West Coasters. And this is a chance for us to talk to the other people in our time zone and say like, oh, you're working alone, I'm working alone, let's get together and pair and join tracks. Um, and it's a time for us to reallocate um, the different pairing roles because we have that interrupt role and the build role and stuff. And so making sure that we have people that are covering all of those roles. And this is not as long as stand-up. Stand-up's pretty quick, but this is even quicker. This can be just two minutes, literally. Um, the downside is, you know, we're not hitting 100% pair, program pair programming anymore. We try, and I think the sync ups help a little bit, um, but, you know, it's inevitable when we have the situation that there's going to be like three hours on either side where in a lot of cases there's going to be people soloing for three hours a day. It's not uncommon now. So it's a little bit of a downside of doing the time zone, um, cross, time, cross time zone development. Um, but it seems to be working all right for us. Um, we're going to continue to see um, how it goes. Um, but so far, it seems like not pair programming 100% of the time hasn't seemed to be a huge issue for us yet. Um, there's also just a general um, want, willingness of the team to do remote development. The team has to actively work towards this. It has to be an entire team buy-in from the remote people and the people, if you have people, in one like central office, they have to be super conscious of the remote people, and it has to be something that people are actively working towards. Um, so the in per there's a lot that kind of rests on um, the in-person people. So in this case, it's the San Francisco people. Um, you know, things like speaking into the mic, having only one conversation going at a time when you're in a meeting, um, and when you have someone interrupting on the phone or they're making some sort of gesture that they want to interrupt, you kind of give them um, a little bit more of the ability to interrupt than you might give them if they were in person because you recognize that it's harder. Um, there's some lag time. There's, you know, it's harder to read body language and stuff like that. And so because it's harder to interrupt and be part of that conversation when you're remote, as someone that's not that's not remote, it's your responsibility to make sure that that person has the stage and is given uh, a voice. And you know, if, if not in that moment when they're interrupting, then you say, okay, hold on one second, Jen, we're just gonna let this person finish and then you. But you, you acknowledge them and you actively give them the stage because you realize that you know, as the person in San Francisco, for example, you have a bit more control um, over who gets to talk and stuff like that. Um, the West Coasters, in our case, so we have the West Coasters that work for three hours at the end of the day, um, where the East Coasters have already signed off. Um, so West Coasters need to be um, aware to write down their story progress at the end of the day. So after they've worked that additional three hours, they need to update what they did on the story and be very clear. I got exactly this far. My work in progress is on this branch for this repo. And that way, an East Coaster can come in in their extra time in the morning. They look at what progress their pair made from the day before, for example, and they can just pick up from where they left off. Um, and there are just like lots of small things you can do. Um, and this is part of just like building up empathy um, for the remote people um, and the wanting, the willingness, and the desire to have a remote team. Um, sorry. Um, so, for example, saying like instead of saying the meeting starts at 11 a.m., you might say the meeting starts in two hours. And these are small things. Um, that you just notice over time, you might catch yourself doing, oh yeah, I just said 11 a.m., but that doesn't make any sense to that person. But you know, by saying something like it starts in two hours, it just kind of like makes it clear that you know, everyone's on the same playing field and you know, it's not like you're trying to say one time zone is the right time zone or something like that. Um, but like I said, it has to be a team priority and people have to want to do this. Um, and there's a lot that rests on the people that are in person if you do have like an in-person core. Um, there are also challenges that we face. Um, in-person interrupts are tough, and by in-person here I mean San Francisco um, in, in our case because we have um, a large, um, many of the core Cloud Foundry teams are all working out of San Francisco. So when I'm pairing with someone that's in San Francisco and someone else from another Cloud Foundry team comes by and interrupts my pair, um, at first, um, you know, a year ago, my pair might have muted the mic, you know, because he thought it was rude to be talking to me and talking to someone in person at the same time. Um, but we learned over time, um, it's actually better not to mute the mic, unless you're talking about something like private to your company. Um, you know, you want to keep that mic on just so like the remote person feels more included. Even though I can't interrupt the person in real time and say something, um, it still feels nice to be able to hear what that discussion is and I have some context. Oh, that, the CAPI team just came over and asked that question. It just helps to keep the mic on. Um, obviously, 
ad hoc discussions are just a natural part of software development, um, especially when you have everyone in an open, shared space working together side by side. You know, you overhear some other pair mention something and you kind of interrupt and be like, oh, wait, I have an idea about that. And then you start talking and then you go to a whiteboard. And obviously that part's a lot harder when you have a remote person. But there has to come a time when you have that and you have remote people where you say like, hold on, let's just pause. This is turning into a little bit of like a design discussion or a meeting. Um, let's uh, actually get a conference room and call, you know, and tell people if they want to come join the call, they can just call in at this number. Um, this might look like a joke, but no ping pong. So in, in San Francisco, um, they have ping pong tables. Um, and it's a great like break in the middle of the day. You've been pairing, you're focused, and you say like, let's just take a 15 minute ping pong break. Um, and it's fun, but it's also pretty useful to actually get up and be standing and doing something physical and be doing something with your pair that's not programming. I think it's actually really healthy. Um, it's a healthy part of like our day. Um, and so it's unfortunate, you know, when you're pairing that you don't have that, and when you're remote pairing you don't have that. Uh, and there's a, it feels a little bit less casual or less familiar sometimes. Like when you're in person with someone, sometimes you feel like you can joke around more, um, you can be more casual, but when you're on the phone suddenly, especially if you've never met the person in person before, it can feel a little bit more formal. Um, and so that's just something you have to be conscious of, and it's something I try to be conscious of, so I try, every time I meet someone new over the phone, I try to be really like friendly and casual, and let's, like, let's not make this too stiff or boring or formal, because I have to, you know, I'm working with the person for eight hours, I wanna feel like you know, we're humans, not just developers. Um, and obviously there's problems if you have like a slow internet connection or something like that. Um, but usually we can get around those like using Tmux instead of a full screen share. Um, so, but other than that, I would say that um, pair pro uh, remote pair programming and remote agile has gone pretty well for us. Um, and as someone that's doing remote agile, like I think it's actually working really well. Um, I go down to San Francisco every couple months as well. Um, but I don't feel like there's a huge, huge difference between when I'm working with people in person and when I'm remote. Um, and I think part of that is just due to the amount of effort the Diego team has put into um, making the remote people a priority um, and making all these changes. Um, so with that, are there any questions? I have not like questions, but uh, we were working remotely for almost half a year. I was working from Dublin to London. There's no time zone difference, but something that helps us is that we feel uh, retro spreadsheet during the day, not the retro time, but like something like that. You just fill in. It's much easier to remember and mm -hmm. helpful. One thing that's it's uh, when you don't pair, as I said, no ping pong breaks, but it's you have to make uh, I don't know timer or something and make yeah. breaks because you just don't see how it's like you worked till lunch without breaks and you're just very tired and other person very tired but you didn't feel because you pair you, you type something that person types out and you just very tired you yeah and you don't you know face to face it's just fun and one more thing that i found i was in san francisco for months and it's a comma that you if you need to interrupt you go to the person but when you work remotely if you want to interrupt, it's much, much e better to ask someone to pop in to appear in, and mm -hmm. you can, it's much easier. You can discuss with your pair, his, uh, his face, and that another pair. It's like for, for, uh, for people discussion, it's much, much easier, and much, much better. Yeah, yeah. I agree with pretty much everything you said. So, the quick summary is that the Google spreadsheets for retro means you can write in the spreadsheet the entire week, not just at retro time, and that's a nice advantage. And um, you can use Appearin for quick interrupts. Um, Appearin is a voice chat, uh, uh, video chat, and you know it's nice to actually see video, not just calls, so you can see people's face. Um, and I forget your oh ping pong breaks. You know you have to remember when you're um, doing remote pairing to always be taking breaks because it might feel a little bit. Um, it, it doesn't come as naturally as when you're in person and like the ping pong break is available. Sorry. Um, any more questions? Yeah. How often does the team meet in person? Um, so the team, so the question is how often does the team meet in person? 
Um, well, it, it changes because the team changes all the time. And so for individual people, there are some people that really can't travel that much. You know, they have young kids or, you know, they, it's just not possible for them to be traveling that often. So they might not travel very much at all to meet with the rest of the team. Um, we have um, maybe every six months to a year um, these inceptions where we kind of get together and uh, talk about the team's direction and what the next big, large tracks of work are going to be. Um, I did one inception remotely, um, and it was very tough. The inception is a full day long meeting, and I found it was just in terms of the actions and stuff like that, it was just very, very hard to be a remote person for that. So the next inception that we did, um, I made a priority to be there in person, and we got the one, I think at that point there was only one other remote person, we got him to come in as well, so we synchronized that. But in general, we haven't, there aren't many times when we say everyone is going to come and get together at one time. Um, and it really depends on the individual person. And like I said, the team is constantly changing. So it really depends on the people. I try to go every two months or so. Um, other people come, at, you know, go to San Francisco either never or a different cadence. So the question was about bigger time zone differences. Uh, on uh, the Diego team itself, no. So we haven't had people on the Diego team. Well, we've had people that work on a specific subcomponent of Diego that are kind of a self-contained um, uh, team working in Europe, for example. Um, but we're not doing direct pairing. Um, you know, we're not assigning pairs across like Europe and the US. Um, we work very closely with Garden, and Garden is based in London. Um, so, you know, we're conscious of these things. We always, you know, have to, you know, make sure, like, if you have Garden questions or if we have uh, a cross-team pair that we want to do with Garden, um, you usually we got, we'll get a US East Coaster to do that cross-team pair, and we need to make sure we prioritize that in the morning and stuff like that. But, you know, it's tough when you have large time zone differences to actually do true pairing. It becomes harder and harder. Uh, so the question is about team size. Um, and so the Diego team right now has um, nine devs. Um, and we that's the largest the team has ever been. I think it's been five devs in the past or something like that. Um, so that's the team that we've worked with. Um, but you know, the larger Cloud Foundry organization as a whole is obviously much larger than that. I think there's like 130 core uh, contributors. And so, like I said, for like Garden and stuff, they all work in London. And so we, we work with them, but they're not on the same exact team as us. So our team is quite, you could say it's quite small um, with nine developers. <laughs> so the question is, how come we can do pair programming when we have an odd number of developers? Um, yeah, nine is not the ideal number. Um, and we try not to have odd numbers. But at the point at which you get to nine developers, that's quite a lot. That's it's very big for a Cloud Foundry team. Um, and so it, at that point, there's, almost, there's always some reason that someone's going to be out that day. Um, and so even if we had eight developers, you know, someone's probably going to be soloing that day just because someone has a doctor's appointment, someone's sick, whatever. Um, but yeah, obviously nine is not ideal for a pair programming team. Yeah. When you have to solo program, do you have another peer review mechanism? Do you have just code review? Uh, the question is when we're doing solo programming, do we do any code review after the fact? Um, actually, we don't. Um, if I'm solo programming, um, usually, I mean, usually I don't work on an entire work item solo. Usually it's like I'll start with someone and then someone goes, you know, they leave for the day and, you know, I, I'm still working and then I'll, I'll just finish it up on my own. So, you know, there's some amount of pairing that goes into pretty much every story. Like there, it's rare the entire story will be done by a single person. Um, but yeah, we, so we don't have any code review. Um, so the question is about a, having a scrum, we're not doing scrum, but do we have like a scrum like, like a scrum master, you mean, like? We have, so we have two special roles on the team. We have the PM, um, they're the like project owner, essentially, they're the one that does the acceptance, they write the stories and actually test that things are accepted. And then we have the anchor, which maybe, you know, I don't know that much about scrum, but the anchor might be doing more of the scrum 
master type stuff. Like they do a little bit more of the day to day. Like they run stand up, they run the retros and stuff like that. But there isn't really that much that needs to be done there. Um, so we're we're about five minutes over. I think there are more questions. Um, I have a little bit of time if you want to come up um, after the fact, but I think I'll let the rest of you go now. <laughs>